and start the lecture. Okay. Uh, yeah, it should work. Right. Okay. So today uh, we will uh, uh, well follow the schedule, which is now more or less should be final. I mean, unless something really unexpected happens. Okay. Uh, but let's hope everything is fine. So today, that's the last lecture we have, uh, let's say, in the room, in this room, and uh, the last uh, theory topic, let's say, okay? Uh, and also we will discuss about exam rules and so on, okay? So, uh, of course, we will record the lecture for everybody's uh, advantage, okay? Then tomorrow there's the lab, and then no activity on Thursday, so no lecture. We already are more or less at uh, 80 hours, including uh, lectures and labs. So that's more or less the eight credits you should get from this course. And uh, um, in the weekend, the text for the final exam will be published. Okay. And then we will still have two other chances to meet. One is in the lab uh, next week. Okay, so Thursday, not during the lecture, but Thursday, uh, sorry, Tuesday. And then Thursday, the last, I mean, lecture, we could also call it exercise. Uh, that's an exercise together, trying to solve uh, something similar to an exam text, okay? I will publish it uh, well before, like uh, at the beginning of next week. So you can think uh, a little bit uh, uh, about how to approach this uh, problem before we meet uh, in the classroom, and we will try to discuss how to design the solution. Then I will also provide the solution that has been made by one of your colleagues in past years, okay? Just to have a look at wh what can be done, okay? Uh, but the important thing is that we understand the advantages and disadvantages of what we are going to try to design, okay? Because that's the most difficult part. And then once you have a, a really reasonable idea of what to implement, you can start implementing it, coding it, and then in case something you feel something is wrong, you go back to the design phase and you fix something and, and you go back coding again, okay? But you need to start with some ideas, right? Okay, that's the, the thing we, we will try to discuss on, on the three hours on uh, June uh, 13th, okay? So today, um, we are going to discuss a bit of fear of remaining important topics, uh, at least in our opinion, for cybersecurity in web application. We will not uh, implement anything today, okay? We will just try to make a deployment on a real website. Uh, um, um, according to the guidelines I, I will give in the next lecture, in the next set of slides, okay? Uh, but before that, I would like to point out a, a few things that we left, uh, let's say, apart and we would like to address before the course ends, okay? So like uh, do's and don'ts, okay? Things to need to be done and things that should not be done, okay? Well, you know that uh, in this uh, last part of the course, in the authorization, uh, sorry, in authentication and authorization operations, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. It's a very delicate uh, part, okay? Uh, there are a lot of security risks that needs to be addressed. Um, <coughs> in particular, these are um, two of the main ones, okay? Uh, uh, about which I would like to draw your attention today. The fact that we need to keep secret all the uh, information that goes back and forth from the client to the server and vice versa, in particular the sessions, ideas, and the tokens, and then how to prevent unauthorized operations in general, even if they seem legitimate because uh, they arrive with this uh, secret information, okay? And this might happen and we will see how and how it can be prevented at least at, at, I mean, till a certain point, okay? So first of all, how to store the information, the secret information in the browser? Well, we have two kinds of secret information that we saw until now. One is the session ID, so the cookie in short, because we put, into, we put it into a cookie. 
and tokens, the JWT tokens that we saw on Thursday last week. Okay, they are both secret information. They can, they shouldn't be disclosed to anybody. Okay, they are just for the application and, and for the user to you to to show that he or she can um, uh, she is um, uh, authenticated and she can or he can uh, perform some operations. Okay. Uh, so the idea is, of course, to limit the access to such secret information as much as possible. Of course, use the browser storage cookies, uh, cookie storage, because that's already designed and treated by the browser in the best possible way from the security point of view. Okay. Uh, use the HTTP only flag that makes it inaccessible from JavaScript, and this is just for any JavaScript that runs into the browser, okay? So it's a separation of, uh, at, uh, at the level of the implementation of the browser. So browser will not let any JavaScript code to access those cookies, okay? Regardless of where they come from, even from our application. That's really important, okay? And why it's important? Because you remember that we talked about uh, uh, cross-site scripting, right? So somebody, an attacker, that uh, inserts malicious JavaScript code in some ways. We don't care about how now. Uh, we just care about the fact that there's some malicious JavaScript code running in our application. But, I mean, if the code cannot access the cookie, the cookie is safe, right? Because it's the, the browser is preventing access in the cookie, okay? Also, that's the secure flag that we will try to set uh, today in a real deployment. We cannot do it in testing because on localhost without HTTPS, we cannot do that. Okay. But now, today, we will try to do that. And it means that the browser will send it only on encrypted communication channels. Again, it's a browser restriction. It's enforced by the browser. So it's very important because, we, um, I mean, unless the browser is buggy, it means that this restriction will be enforced, okay? Regardless of any anything done by any attacker, wherever, okay? Uh, what's the problem of sending the cookie or the, the, the session ID or the token on an unencrypted channel? Well, it can be uh, um, looked at and can be taken, I mean, uh, copied by the attacker and used in some other requests coming from other places toward the same server, okay? But if the channel is encrypted, of course, the attacker can look at the bits, but it doesn't understand what they, what's their meaning, okay? But unfortunately, it is not possible. Like we saw Thursday, we have the token, and the token must be added by JavaScript in the request, in the fetch headers, right? So. If the JavaScript has to add the other, JavaScript needs to have access to the token, right? Okay, so there will be, you know, occasions in which this is not really possible. I mean, preventing accessing the, the information from JavaScript, okay? And there are advantages and disadvantages in the two approaches. Of course, we could uh, send it as a cookie, but then it's a second cookie. It's not a, a token, an author uh, authorization token that can be added or not, depending on you know, the, 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 the occasions and so on. Okay, and then just to remember the, the fact that the browser nowadays has a lot of uh, methods to store information locally. That's not just the uh, cookie storage that basically is accessible only when the server sends back an HTTP header with a set uh, cookie uh, and a value, a key, I mean, uh, and then the value is the cookie. Uh, there is, a, for instance, with HTML5, uh, there's a lot of web storage APIs that uh, uh, application developers can use to store information. For instance, maybe you tried the, the offline Google Doc application. So it says, uh, do you want to be able to edit this document offline? Yes, no, yes. And where does it store the information? I mean, the browser cannot access the a file system, the local file system. Okay, that's an important restriction for security, again. But it has some local storage where things can be stored uh, at least at, until a certain expiration date, okay? 
and the application, like in this case, the Google Doc will uh, um, synchronize things uh, when it comes back online. Okay, so it will take information from the local storage and send it uh, to the um, remote server and so on. Okay, and you will see that this uh, storage is available in many applications. Like we can see them. If you open the page and you see there's a storage tab, you see the local storage, the session storage, okay? They exist, they are available. They are available for any website, okay? As long as JavaScript uses these APIs. Well, since we are interesting, interested in cybersecurity here, yeah, there's just only, a, only, a, only one advice I, I can give you, okay? Never use this storage for um, secret information or critical information in general, okay? Because, because anybody can access, I mean, uh, anybody can modify this information. Um, uh, it's uh, really risky to store information here, okay? Uh, <coughs> Why? Because basically, that's a s the, the usual risks. Any cross-site scripting vulnerability means that JavaScript has access to this place. Local storage, session storage, whatever storage, and so on. Okay? Because this stuff, to be useful, needs to be available to JavaScript. But if there are JavaScript uh, vulnerabilities in the form of cross-site scripting, this is a problem, okay, for any kind of storage that we have locally, okay? So it's not the fact that, uh, yeah, of course, session storage, local storage, uh, they are restricted to the same origin, okay, that's fine. But, uh, I mean, the cross-site scripting vulnerability doesn't care about this. If there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in Google Doc, you know, things will be sent to some attackers or whatever, whatever application is using this uh, uh, session storage, local storage, we cannot do anything, right? So, in short, never use them to store sensitive or secret information and never use them uh, without being very careful. So, do, don't consider such data as trusted data. Just because you put it there come and the data came from a, a trusted source, Okay, you, you processed it uh, and you sanitized it, uh, whatever you did it on this data. Don't expect that when you retrieve it from the storage, it will be uh, exactly the same as when you stored it. Okay, because there can be cross-site scripting attacks that modifies that data in a malicious way. Maybe in a form that can still be processed but has side effects. Okay, basically, these cross-site scripts are all side effects, things that you wouldn't want to be executed in your application, okay? Um, <coughs> so, session IDs, tokens, and so on, shouldn't be stored there, probably. I mean, session IDs, uh, if you're using them in the form of cookies, of course not. We have an alternative, a very good alternative. It's the cookie storage with the HTTP only option. Okay? And tokens, well, it depends. Okay? Token, uh, well, we, we, can, we can store them as cookies if we need to make them permanent. Uh, but then we need to be aware of the fact that every time we make a request, this token will be sent. Okay? And will be sent in the form of a cookie. Okay? And uh, so it, will, it needs to be received on the server side in the form of a cookie. Um, but it's not that difficult to achieve, okay? There's a get token function that we saw on, uh, um, on Thursday last week uh, where you can modify that, uh, that function a little bit and get the token from a cookie instead of an header. Fine, okay? Um, okay. So this is a comparison table between uh, the cookies versus alternative approaches. Of course, each solution has advantages and disadvantages. Like the cookie, uh, 
uh, it's automatically handled by the browser. That's a good thing. If you don't have to write code, there's no chance that you can write uh, bad code or wrong code, right? Okay. It can be made inaccessible to JavaScript code. That's very good. Uh, can be made uh, to be sent only on secure connections. That's good. But unfortunately, it cannot be sent by third to third. Uh, uh, yeah, by and to third parties. This is restricted to the same host, okay? Mm, scheme and host, we say it. That's a cookie, okay? So if I have two servers with two different host names, static, bank, com, API dot com, they cannot share the cookie, okay? It needs to be set by the same server that will need to receive it, okay? Uh, and this is also always sent for any request. The browser doesn't care if it's a get, post, put, delete, if it's a sensitive request or not. It's set, it's not expired, it meets the requirement, it means uh, it's a secure connection, it's a secure cookie, fine, it will be sent. Regardless the way in which you did the request, either clicking in your email and opening the browser, or with a click in the application, or with the fetch, and so on, okay? So, uh, this exposes uh, the cookie to some attacks, and we will discuss these attacks in a few minutes, okay? The other approaches on the other side gives a lot more flexibility because we are not restricting to treat them as cookie. It's a value, we can put it into the uh, URL if, you, if we like. I mean, not very common, but we could do that. We can use it as HTTP headers. Uh, that's much more common. It can be sent only when required by the JavaScript because we need to add it explicitly, okay? Because we need to create a fetch uh, call that uh, sends also this token. It's not automatic by the browser. But of course, on the other side, so um, the cons, uh, that uh, we need to explicitly manage the storage of such cookie. And in our uh, situation, in this course, we use the React framework, and in short, it means that we need to store the value into a React state, as any other um, information that comes from the server. And as such, since it's a variable, basically, in JavaScript, it can be accessed by any JavaScript code, okay? We can use uh, tricks and closures, whatever, and so on, but in short, it's it, it just uh, some value in, uh, in JavaScript. So if an attacker finds uh, a vulnerability, uh, something weak in the way we code the page, it can try to exploit it with a cross-scripting attack, okay? So there are advantages and disadvantages, as you can see, for both approaches, cookies and all the other approaches that don't rely on cookies, okay? So let's address the first uh, issue that is the easiest one. <laughs> um, the easier one, let's say. How to transmit the information uh, securely when it's secret? Well, nowadays it's very simple. You just force uh, the browser to use encrypted channel, it means HTTPS. Uh, that's the schema, right? The, 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 the first part of the protocol, yeah. You see, it's not very big, but I'm sure you're familiar with this, okay? HTTPS, okay? Instead of HTTP. And also the browser displays a closed lock instead of open lock and all these nice uh, icons and stuff, okay? But what's the meaning? The meaning is that it establishes a secure channel with the destination, so between the client and the server, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, so it provides confidentiality. That means that you read the information, the bit that goes from client to server and vice versa, and you cannot understand what's the actual data that is going from server to client and client to server, okay? So in short, you cannot read the data that is transmitted. You cannot, uh, I mean, you can sniff, but uh, it has no meaning unless you have the keys of the communication, so of the encryption, for decryption. 
It provides also integrity. Some of you mentioned that during the course, what about if the same request is sent again? Okay. I don't know what it means, but maybe it's the request that is uh, creates a something I don't know. Do something which I'm interested to 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 reply. Okay. I send this information, even if I cannot read, I send it again towards the server. With this protocol, it's not possible. Integrity means it, the attacker cannot modify the traffic, so it cannot you know, insert traffic even if the, uh, the meaning is not known. It cannot reply traffic to, uh, towards the destination. Okay? And it also provides authentication, but it is a, m a longer story, and I hope some, somebody else in this uh, course of study will address this. So when you connect to a server, you hope to be connected to the server, which actually is the one who claims to be. Okay? So I'm connecting to bank.com. I hope that the website is actually bank.com and not somebody in the middle of the communication that just provides me a response uh, acting as bank.com and then so it can terminate the connection so it can decrypt the traffic because we will establish a common key for the encryption between the, mm, us, the client, and this uh, uh, fake server and then uh, it will send the information later towards the actual server just to show uh, it's working okay and how do you achieve this well you achieve it through a server certificate so you need to trust some entity that signs a certificate that is provided when uh, you connect to the server and it says this is uh, the server with this name and I'm guaranteeing you that uh, this certificate that the server is providing is actually for this uh, entity Okay, and that's actually what comes out when you click here on the lock uh, and connection secure, more information and so on, and view certificate, etc. Okay, but actually this is out of uh, the scope of this course. Okay, just uh, 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 something that we give it f for granted. And typically the browser warns us if the common name that is set in the certificate is different from the one to which we are connecting, like this github.com, okay? If, if bank.com provides a certificate that says, uh, I don't know, uh, polytechnical.com, of course, the browser will warn us, okay? But the point is that even if it provides bank.com, uh, it needs to be signed by somebody that you trust as a client. Where's the, the page info? Uh, no, this one. So there should be a certification authority, okay, that, that, that say that you trust and that uh, put a sign on this certificate saying, I verify that this certificate belongs to actually to the owners of bank.com, okay? Um, so this last point is important, uh, but it's actually out of the scope of the uh, discussion here, okay? Um, <coughs> so once we have uh, a, an encrypted channel, like uh, with the HTTPS, let's say protocol, even though the protocol is a bit different, like TLS and stuff, okay? But it's managed by the browser, so we don't really care in this moment. We can send secret information without fearing that is being uh, sniffed, intercepted, uh, read by somebody who shouldn't read it, okay? Uh, that means the attacker. If the attacker gets the session ID, it just creates a fake request towards the server, but with the session ID, it makes them look authentic because the session ID is supposed to be known only by the authenticated user, right? Okay, actually the browser or the authenticated user. How to configure HTTPS correctly? Well, actually, this uh, stuff in security is always a long story, <laughs> okay? Just use the reputable websites with good advice, like OWASP is a very good reference, at least as a starting point. You just click on the links that we try to provide uh, during the whole course. 
and read all the stuff, try to understand you know, all the points here. Like don't use older version of the protocol and you know, support only strong ciphers and all this stuff, which are the ones, etc. Maybe there are pointers to other places where they have this list of strong ciphers and strong and good practices and so on. Okay? And you see there's there's plenty of attacks that can be done also in this uh, context. Like this one. <laughs> this is one of the weirdest ones, right? Disable compression. Have a look at them. Okay, we don't have the time, but it's really nice. Okay, I leave it as a homework. Um, only for this course, only for configuration simplicity and easier debugging at the exam, we will not use the HTTPS, okay, as we did until now in the course. Just for simplicity, because using HTTPS, it's not just, you know, enabling a flag. Yeah, that's, that would be the easiest thing. If it's just that, we could do that, okay? But it means dealing with all the server certificates and uh, approving that you can connect to certificates which are self-signed in case you don't have a certification authority and so on, and the certification authority will not provide you certificates for local host, okay? And then you have uh, things shared uh, uh, on the same host, which is localhost, on different ports, uh, and cookie gets shared, and you know, a, lo a lot of things that we would need to manage that makes us lose a lot of time for the exam. I mean, where basically uh, everybody of you has to give an oral exam, and if, we, if it takes five, minutes, uh, five additional minutes for everybody of you, it means that we will take two days more for the exams. Okay, since you are, actually you are 180 students enrolled, okay, at the end uh, of, the, of the course. Uh, you started 140, I think, okay, and somebody added himself or herself later, okay, for some reasons. We don't really care, but basically these are the, all the ones that can come at the exam, okay. Um, so, it's quite a large number. Okay, so that's one of the points, uh, and let's say this is the easiest one to solve, because once we have a certificate and we can enable HTTPS following good guidelines, we are done. Okay, nothing, nothing more. Maybe just the client configuration, send the cookie only on encrypted connection. We will see it an example in the deployment. It's very easy, just one line in the code. Okay. And so let's come to the other point, which is more tricky. You have authenticated sessions. Actually, I have an authenticated session with GitHub in, at the moment, okay? And probably, maybe s something else, maybe with the didactica web portal of the university and so on. So I have valid cookies in the browser currently. And so, if I send requests towards some servers, they will be sent to, uh, together with the cookie. That means with the session ID, with a valid session ID. And often, this valid session ID will be interpreted by the server as a, 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 uh, as a way to understand that I am the one who is authorized to do some action, okay? Because I authenticated myself earlier. Maybe not even today because there are cookies that last days, months, and so on, okay? When you click on remember me, when you log in, basically means uh, make a cookie that lasts uh, quite a, a long time, so I don't have to enter the username and password again for a while, okay? And what's the problem of this situation? Well, the problem is that this session ID in the form of a cookie will be always, always sent by the browser towards the server for any request towards that server. That means that the schema, HTTP or HTTPS, let's say, let's use only HTTPS because that's the best practice. And then with that host name, okay? And if somebody is able to trick me in sending a request from my browser towards that host, where I have the authenticated uh, session ID, I will ask the server to perform some action, some actions, okay? And this click can come from many different places. This is just an example 
I mean, uh, the example here is an email, but could be a link you find ar around in the web, in a web forum, uh, uh, whatever place, a link that has been shared by, uh, by chat by one of your friends that you assume to be friend. <laughs> it no, will not be friend anymore after this. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. A, a fake page uh, constructed in some ways that uh, it can send a request to towards this uh, website, okay? A fake form. The form is one of, of the uh, most dangerous texts uh, because it can send as action request towards uh, websites which are not only the one from the same origin because of historical reasons. You know, 30 years ago, it was like this. Everybody was, everything was trusted, okay? So if they make a, a fake form and you are tricked into clicking there, for some reason, you can even send post requests, not just get requests. It's just an example. And so what can we do about this? So the problem is that we have this valid session ID, and this valid session ID will be transmitted. We cannot do anything, OK? Because that's how the browser, all modern browsers work. And if the request is a malicious request, it will be executed by the, the website, okay? And it can create uh, some damages. This is the easiest damage to understand. I mean, go to the bank, transfer money to, to somebody else, okay? But it can be any damage. It can be inserting fake data into a database, uh, delete uh, information from the database. Uh, these are all damages that can be done, okay? Um, I mean, we don't really care about the type of damage. So the fact is that there is somebody, an attacker, that can make requests look as authorized and the web server will execute them because they are actually authorized because they come with a valid session ID. Okay? And so, this is called cross-site request forgery CSRF attack. Okay? You will hear about this uh, uh, acronym uh, quite a lot. And uh, it's more like a <laughs> XSS, right, uh, cross-site scripting. But this is a different way of proceeding. It doesn't require JavaScript. It just relies on the fact that the browser automatically sends this session ID automatically, okay? And of course, it only works if the session ID is, not is still valid. If you logged out from the bank uh, website, it doesn't work because either the cookie is expired, is deleted, so there's no more any cookie in, in the form of the session ID, or the server will reject it because it says, well, that's an expired session ID, okay? So it only works if the session ID is valid, but as I told you, I have a valid uh, session IDs with many websites around, okay? You, uh, you, you often open many websites, in the same browser, okay? In some of them, you are logged in. That means you have a valid session ID. So, how can we solve the problem? Well, actually, we cannot really definitely solve the problem. We can just mitigate the problem. Because, uh, I mean, it's an intrinsic fact that I have the right to access and do operation in that website. So. Uh, the, uh, the, the point is, I need to limit the possibility that I did the, this operation by mistake, okay? Because I clicked on a link uh, outside, like an email, or I found a link on the forum and so on. Or I, I was deceived in some ways to, to do the operation, okay? Because somebody has told me to do it on the phone, okay? Could also be outside the computer, okay? Uh, so, to make this uh, operation work, so the cross-site request forgery attack, you must to have a, an authenticated session active and the execution of a sensitive action, so the action you wouldn't want to do, relies on the presence of a simple authentication factor, so only the cookie, for instance, okay? But this is very typical for very simple website like ours, for instance, okay? We only check the cookie on the server. 
and there is nothing else that needs to be sent by the, the client to the server that would be potentially unknown to the attacker. Okay? If, because if there's something else that needs to be sent, this attack will not work anymore. Okay? So indeed, a possible mitigation strategy is to use an additional value to be sent to the server. Okay? that is not automatically sent by the browser, but needs to be sent in some ways with the collaboration of something else, like uh, JavaScript code in the browser, or maybe also from the user. Okay, we will see both solutions. Okay. The first solution implies there's an, out, uh, an additional value, secret value, of course, that is stored in the browser and it's sent to the server only if you have the correct execution of the JavaScript code on the client. So you cannot just click on a link. This uh, operation needs to be performed by the JavaScript, like with an asynchronous uh, request towards the server, like with a fetch, and the fetch in the code has to include this information. This uh, information that we will call it token, which is not a JWT token. It's just a token means a piece of information, okay? A string, a random string, whatever you want. Um, which is often called the CRSF token because used to, to solve this problem, the CRF attack, or an anti-forgery token or request verification token. These are all names for the same thing, okay? But you can substitute token with string. Of course, a, a reasonably complex and random string, okay? <laughs> cannot be fixed, otherwise the attacker just, you know, use the fixed string and solves the problem. So, how does this approach work? Well, first of all, you need to create this token. So in the first interaction, typically at login, when you authenticate the user, you provide the user also with this information, this CSRF, CSRF token. That's a random string, nothing else. I mean, a long random string, like at the session ID. That's basically a long random string, okay? And this information is stored by the client and by the server as well, like the session ID, okay? But the difference is the CRF token is stored in the JavaScript memory, in some variable somewhere, not in the cookie storage. If I make it a cookie, I don't solve anything because both cookies will be sent automatically. I need to control when I, I send this CRF token to the server, okay? Because in this way, simple interaction with the server will send the cookie if they start from my browser, but will not send the token if the JavaScript didn't process the request and you know decided to send the token. So the server, of course, has to keep the value associated to the session. This value is typically uh, lasting until the session lasts. So until the session is valid, and when the session is deleted, typically this token is also deleted, and a new one will be created when you log in again, okay? Um, and then, then we, when you interact with the server, at least for the critical operations, like uh, post, uh, transfer money, again, with the bank, and so on, of course, you need to be able to do that. Otherwise, the, the, the web application becomes useless, right? Well, what's the point of having a web application with a bank if you cannot do the operations, okay? <laughs> you are the legitimate user, you need to be able to do the operation. So, how do I interact with the bank, with the uh, bank web server to do the operation? Well, every time I make a, a risky request or a sensitive request, I add this token with an additional HTTP header, for instance. That's the easiest way, okay? But it can be in any, in any way. I mean, headers are easier to process from the client and server point of view because, you know, the fetch has a specific uh, field in, in, the, in the object, okay? And you don't have to invent any particular format. You use an additional header, access something, it means it's an application-dependent header, 
So it's not standardized, but don't, even though, I mean, CRF is almost <laughs> standardized, but uh, I mean, you don't uh, really need to uh, have a standard for this. Uh, you just need to know what's the name of the header on the client and on the server. And on the server, you will look for that name and will search for the value, okay? So you send this uh, value here in the request and the server will check if it matches with the CRF token associated with the valid session ID that will come in the cookie, okay? But the point that this token is added only by the JavaScript code on, this, on the client, okay? It's not automatically sent by the browser. Otherwise, it would be useless. It would be exactly as, as before, okay? And so, if everything matches, of course, the server will just say, well, okay, I will do the operation and we instruct, uh, you know, the bank or whatever uh, server and so on to do the operation, okay? This is just an example with a bank transfer, but again, it can be any, any sensitive uh, operation. Destroy the database, <laughs> delete the table, delete, uh, I don't know, delete the repository, like GitHub. When you delete a repository, they want you to make 100% uh, sure what you're doing and so on, okay? To make everything work, don't, don't store the token as a cookie. Okay, this is really, really important because we are doing all this operation because the session ID is put into the cookie that is automatically sent to the, bra uh, to the client, uh, server, sorry, to the server by the client. And so, what will happen with the attacker? Well, the attacker does exactly the same thing as before. It sends a link, uh, it tricks you into clicking on some links or some places where you create a request toward the server sent by your client. But the point is that it cannot add this uh, additional information. So the request will be sent without a token, okay? Because it doesn't know where it is, okay? If it does a, a cross-site scripting, then it can. Indeed, this is a mitigation, it's not a solution, okay? But in general, when it prepares the link, it doesn't know the value of the token. So the token will not be sent and the server will refuse the operation because it says, well, there's a missing CRF token. There's no token. I will not do the operation. You need to provide me the token if you would like me to do the operation. Or if there's a random value, whatever value, it will check if they match. If they don't match, there will be a mismatch and will not do the operation. Okay? So the forged link or way of sending the request from the browser to the client, which was not uh, envisaged in the beginning from the application designer, will not include the token, okay? And so will be refused by the server. But of course, as I told you, remember, this is just a mitigation strategy. What's the difference uh, between a mitigation and, uh, let's say, a solution? So HTTPS is a solution for confidentiality, okay? Because unless the algorithm is broken, uh, it, it will work and it will prevent anybody without the key from accessing the information, okay? Here, it's just a mitigation. So there's another way in which I can be attacked to, you know, uh, go around this protection. While in encryption, unless the algorithms are broken, there's no way to attack the encryption, so to decrypt the information, unless you have the key, okay? Unless you do what is uh, specified by the algorithm for, the, for decryption, okay? Of course, things can be broken in the future. We, do, we, ne we never know. I mean, cybersecurity is about this. I mean, and people, trying to protect and people trying to attack, okay? It's like people trying to steal and people trying to defend, right? But in general, I mean, there are techniques uh, which are, uh, seems to be good for protection, like encryption, okay? And there are techniques that just try to limit the problem, okay? But they are well aware of the fact that uh, there might be ways 
of overcoming the protection, okay? So they are mitigation strategies, mitigation approaches. Why? Because since everything is done via JavaScript, uh, if you have uh, cross-site scripting attacks, that means that the attacker can control in some ways what you are doing in JavaScript. And so he can also add the token. And so we are back from, you know, uh, starting point. If you can add the token in some ways, this uh, technique becomes useless, okay? Of course, it does, it's a mitigation in the sense that uh, maybe your application is not vulnerable to cross-site scripting, so it's good, okay? But what about if some, at a certain point there's somebody that comes out with an idea to, you know, to, to, to perform a cross-site scripting attack on your application? You will not be protected anymore, yes? Yes. Yes. No, that additional token is only added by JavaScript, by the JavaScript code running on the client when it's required by the way in which uh, the application has been designed. Like the bank says, to perform a, a money transaction, you need to send a CRF token, okay? Or in general, you can say, for any authenticator request, you need to add the CRF token, <laughs> okay? The JavaScript uh, on the client knows that, and it will add the token. The JavaScript has been loaded by the website, okay? So, from the original bank uh, uh, website, okay? So, it's not malicious, okay? But what about if uh, there is uh, some code there that is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So some code can be injected in the way the page works, tricking the page into adding the, 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 um, uh, the token, even in cases where I, I wouldn't do that, okay? Just click on simple links, I wouldn't do that, okay? So yes. When I received the JS from the server. Yes. No, the token is typically sent uh, after authentication, okay? Otherwise, it would be always the same token for all applications. That's not good because the attacker can just access the server and it will get the code. The attacker can access the server without authentication. It will get uh, the JavaScript code as any other users, okay? So, this token needs to be uh, uh, given back only after authentication and it needs to be different for each uh, user. Okay? I hope I've been clear. Okay, thanks. Because it needs to be, it's a private information, additional private information which is just uh, managed differently on the client. Okay? Okay. Um, okay, and indeed, <laughs> recently, if you look around, uh, for instance, again, on OWASP or, or, you know, in some places where they describe vulnerabilities, classify vulnerabilities and so on, also, there are client-side CRF attacks uh, developed, okay? Uh, of course, once you know the how the attack works, you can try to modify your JavaScript code, uh, you know, to, to, to avoid uh, this problem. But, uh, I mean, until you fix it, uh, you will be exposed to the attack, okay? So, in general, <laughs> this uh, CRSF uh, mm, attack, it's, uh, it's a big problem, okay? How can we treat these cases? Again, there's no definitive solution. But I would like to mention one, because it's very widely used nowadays. Unfortunately, we don't have time to implement all this stuff in our application, also because it, you know, it requires uh, quite a lot of code and, you know, and discussions. And this is a basic course about web application. Let's not forget this, okay? And we would like to keep it in to eight, uh, eight credits, okay? I could explain that the double things, but then you need to work double things, and the value of the course is still eight credit, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, I think you already experienced uh, this multi-factor authentication. That's a different way to approach the same problem. Okay. So you have this uh, 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 session ID that goes from client to server. That's the authenticated uh, session ID. But since it's so difficult to protect web application because there are so many attacks around, cross site scripting, the cross site request forgery attack, and so on. So a few years ago, somebody came out with an idea saying, well, let's try to request an additional form of authentication to perform uh, operations, okay? In particular, login operations. Uh, they start with the login operation, that's why they call it authentication, but can be used for authorization as well. And how? Well, you use uh, um, a, a different uh, authentication factor, okay? And what's uh, an authentication factor? Well, that's uh, what you see on, OWA on the OWASP uh, website. Something you know, that's what we are used to, the password, the PIN, uh, all these secret uh, strings, basically, that you use for authentication. And then something you have can be another factor, like tokens, smart cards, uh, uh, SMS, Okay, an SMS you receive on a different device, phone calls and so on. Okay, something you get in some ways which are different from the way you get the web application. Or maybe something more recent, something you are, the fingerprint, the, fascia, the face, uh, the iris scan in the eye and so on. Somewhere you are, well, it depends if you can really, you know, detect this or, 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 or you know, how, how difficult it is to, to, to fake this, okay? So, for instance, your source IP address at least says if you are in which country you are, okay? For instance. Uh, or something you do, you do the way you type on the keyboard, the way you move the mouse, the way you walk, walk around and so on, okay? Well, just examples, okay? I'm not saying you can use all of them or it's easy to use them, okay? But just to give you an idea of different factors as they were classified by the cybersecurity experts. So the user is required to present more than one type of evidence to authenticate on a system or in general to authorize uh, some operations, okay? Later, in the beginning, of course, that's authentication because we need to establish the session. And then, you know, with the, like with the CRF, uh, CSRF, uh, we need to authorize operations, even if the authentication is already in place. So the most common uh, commonly used uh, authentication of this kind is the two-factor authentication, often uh, abbreviated as 2FA, okay? I'm sure you experimented this stuff, okay? You need to have two factors uh, to, that belong to different categories to be useful. Because, I mean, sending two passwords, uh, password plus PIN, instead of one password, is just like sending a longer password, okay? So, if the factor doesn't belong to another category, it's more or less the same as before, so it doesn't help, okay? Also, I, I've put this quote, uh, which I found on OWAS, which is very significant, okay? Uh, you, you can find it, I think uh, it was uh, like... Uh, uh, by far, yeah, uh, 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 it also suggests that it stops 99.9% uh, .9 of uh, compromised accounts and so on. So it's quite effective, okay? You cannot really stop 100%, okay? But, uh, you know, this success rate is quite uh, good, right? Um, 
This is typically required as login, but might also be appropriate to require this uh, second authentication factor uh, when you do sensitive actions. For instance, many websites ask you to do this uh, operation, so to provide a second authentication factor uh, when you perform sensitive actions such as changing the password because it will risk to lock out uh, you know, the, uh, the user the, if it's performed by the attacker, or the contact email, or disabling the two-factor authentication, okay, which is, of course, a very critical action, or granting some additional privileges, whatever for, becoming administrator in some website and so on, okay? Or in general, performing some sensitive operation, operation that cannot be rolled back easily and so on, like transferring money, uh, I don't know, dele deleting things that cannot be undone and stuff like that, okay? Uh, this is depends, uh, really depends on, on, on the logic of the application. Just to give you an example of how, how these things work, well, something you have could be uh, the so-called one-time password, okay? So a password, so a value that you will send that is valid just for one interaction with the server, uh, so-called OTP, okay, one-time password. And they can be both hardware-based and software-based. Maybe you had some, some of these hardware-based tokens. Uh, typically, they were distributed by banks uh, a few years ago. Now, most, if not all banks uh, here use software tokens. Okay, because they are more convenient. Stuff that runs basically on a mobile phone. Okay, so, uh, software that runs on a mobile phone. But f for a while, um, the, there were software tokens, so small devices, like that you add on, on your set of keys and you bring it with you and so on. Typically small. That basically provide you sort of random number, but it was not really random, it was a pseudo-random number that was computed in some ways, uh, uh, depending on uh, a secret key that was uh, available to both the server, so in this case your bank, and in the device. And of course you couldn't extract the key from the device, okay? You couldn't open it uh, and so on, okay? But in general, it cannot be extracted by, by an attacker that that runs something in your web browser because it's a physical device which is separate from your browser, okay? These are very good, almost impossible to compromise remotely because, I mean, it's a separate uh, physical device, okay? Your, your, your computer has no hands, okay, <laughs> to click and do things or eyes. Well, eyes it, it can have, but... Uh, but of course, uh, handling these devices is very complicated from a logistical point of view and also costly, okay? They are physical devices, they have a cost. It's not like software, you click, you download, and basically the cost is almost uh, zero, okay? Just the cost of transferring a few bits, but maybe it's already paid by somebody else. But it also requires some special server hardware and, and so on, mm. but uh, I mean, uh, just to give you an idea of the fact that these uh, tokens that provide, token means the device in this case, uh, this, uh, um, this device can provide one-time password. Typically, that's a value that after a few seconds changes. So you have the time to read the value, put it into the website, click OK, and then the value has changed. Okay? And you can also turn it on and off uh, just in to say battery because you cannot replace the battery, okay? But nowadays, software OTP tokens, so one-time password tokens are, the, the, you know, mostly used, uh, which are typically used to generate time-based one-time passwords, okay? So password that depends on some secret value plus the current time, okay? So the time always increments over time. So it cannot go back because the server has the same ti time more or less as you. So a little bit of tolerance is allowed, but uh, I mean, uh, everybody agrees on a common time reference and you cannot roll back time. 
So you cannot uh, use uh, uh, passwords, one-time passwords that have been uh, generated in the past if they are too old. Okay? And typically they are implemented via an application on the user's smartphone. There's plenty of applications. Actually, the format is quite, uh, some of them, most of them are standardized. One very common application is the Google Authenticator. Maybe you, you have it on your smartphone. But there are other applications, uh, even open source ones, which are compatible with this format. The format is known, so there's not, no real reason why you should use a closed app for these things, okay? Especially if the format is open. So what are these uh, TOTP? Means uh, time-based uh, one-time passwords. Well, uh, they are used for uh, authorized sensitive actions when you interact uh, with the uh, website. Typically, they are requested at login. And, you know, establishing an authenticated session is typically a sensitive action because then you can operate on the website. And for particularly critical operations. Uh, these are, uh, they have a lot of advantages. They are cheap. They're basically, you download the app. You do it all the time. <laughs> no logistic issues. There's nothing, there's no uh, physical object that needs to be shipped. Okay? If you lose it, you don't need to wait uh, for somebody to ship your device, this device to you and so on. Easily changed again and so on. It's not a physical object, it's just software. So it comes with all the advantages of software. But of course, there are also disadvantages. For instance, also smartphones might be subject to attacks, right? Uh, if, the, if you have the, the application on the same device that you use uh, um, to establish the authentication session, that's not a really good idea. Okay, if you are navigating to a website and then they ask you a uh, one-time password and you look for the one-time password on the same device, as you do it, uh, you know, it, since it's the same device, it's not a separate device, maybe some attacker can find a way to steal this, uh, this code while you search for it and so on. Uh, to make them, mm, this uh, kind of password work, note that a common secret should be established. Okay, uh, we will not enter into, into many details about this, uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure you experienced uh, it. Uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, um, you establish uh, a new account with some website, uh, which is uh, security conscious, let's say. So it, it takes a, a security uh, very seriously. Okay, like nowadays, most of the major, um, um, you know, uh, internet no uh, providers of uh, web services uh, uh, use this approach. Okay, you log in on GitHub, and they say, "Do you want to enable two-factor authentication?" You log in on Google, you didn't have. You didn't enable uh, two-factor authentication yet. Uh, please do it, uh, at least in some form. Give me a mobile phone number to which I can send an SMS. Give me, uh, I, I will provide, d download the Google Authenticator and so on, okay? Um, and in this uh, activation phase, they provide you with a secret value that will be stored both on the server and on your device, this device that will be able to generate the one-time password, okay? In general, this is stored into a QR code that you can easily scan with a, uh, a smartphone. But just for convenience, you can copy and paste it, uh, I mean, copy manually, I mean, type on the mobile phone, but you know that uh, typing on mobile phones is not so convenient. And if it's a long string, long random string, it becomes difficult. That's why typically you scan it and that's all. And the application will store the secret and will keep it for uh, inside and will not show the secret. And it will only provide the codes 
okay, that will change over time uh, when, uh, uh, when you ask uh, for them. Okay? Um, note that the server will never send again this information, otherwise it would be pointless, right? It needs to be kept secret on the server side. Otherwise, the attacker, if the attacker is able to know the secret, of course, it can generate the codes, and so it bec they become useless. So that's why they tell you, scan it now, and then they ask for a confirmation. Tell me one of the codes generated by this application. So I'm sure you scanned it, because I will not show you again this code. Okay? Why? Because if I do it, uh, you might be the attacker. I hope the first time you're not the attacker. Okay? But actually, if you are creating the account, I mean, if you are, if you are the attacker, you, it will be your account. Okay? Uh, and if you are enabling it later, that's a problem. Typically, the, you need to be very careful, right? You need maybe to have a second factor in another way, like send an SMS. If you do it with the bank, they send you an SMS, they send you a phone call or whatever to authorize this kind of operation because it, it, it's very risky, okay? And uh, again, uh, we will not enter in, you know, implementing all this stuff. But I just wanted to mention that it's not just, uh, you know, that protecting against uh, CRSF is, uh, you know, let's implement a token. It's just a mitigation strategy. And then, then you still have the problem of the cross scripting and so on. And so you need to resort to a s another way. Another way could be the multi-factor authentication, okay? But even that one, might not be completely safe if, because if somebody takes control of the, you know, the mobile phone as well, or you're logging in from the mobile phone as well, and so on. So there are no methods which are 100% sure in this, in this context because everything can be attacked, okay? Um, so in general, these are complex problems. I mean, I will always say this. <laughs> Um, I know this is a cybersecurity course. It might not be fantastic the way in which we <laughs> end the course. In a sense, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of problems uh, uh, in front of us. But that, that's the way the world is, right? So, I mean, there's somebody that tries to break in and there's somebody that tries to keep uh, the attackers out, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, the, the game of the world, I would say. And again, Never invent your own mechanism. Try to use standardized and well-tested mechanism. Okay? This is the recommended procedure that I feel uh, confident in giving you. It's very qualitative. Identify a system which is suitable, well suited for your case. Okay? If, if it's not suitable for your case, maybe you should use another mechanism. Okay? Study it in depth, so study it very well. Uh, rely on all advices and best practices that you can find around, hopefully in reputable sources. I mean, I just, just don't go and read on forums around, okay? If, you, if you're stuck in some places uh, for, some, for some reasons, uh, maybe reading around uh, might give you an idea of what's going on, okay? But don't, just don't copy and paste the code, you know, from places uh, around the, that you don't actually understand, okay? If you do copy and paste, that's, that's also for the exam. I mean, we, we don't prevent anybody from taking code from wherever because we cannot, right? You are doing the, the exam at home. So just take it <laughs> and use it. But at the exam, you need to be able to explain what the code is doing. And that's the best security practice, probably, okay? Uh, because in this way, you, you understand the implications of your code. And then, last but not least, don't forget that you need to maintain what you do over time. Sometimes it will not be your responsibility in a company and so on, but somebody needs to take care of this aspect, okay? This aspect needs to be addressed. I cannot just say, well, 
that's my best uh, way of securing the system. Great, that's it. You pay for me? Okay, that's fine if you are a contractor. But <laughs> if you are the owner, the responsible for website, it's not uh, really nice, right? Because uh, after a while, maybe the, you know, some, somebody comes, in, comes out and says, wait, there's a way to attack this kind of approach. And you need to be aware of that uh, and try to address the situation by changing the system, the code, and so on, by uh, follow the latest security recommendation that says to, let's say, disable this algorithm, change the way in which this activity is performed, and so on, change the library because it's been shown to be uh, not, se not implemented securely, and so on, okay? So, in general, the system also needs to be maintained over time, okay? That's a general advice. Of course, this does not apply to to this course, because once you submit a project, you get a good mark, <laughs> we say bye-bye. But, I mean, in general, I mean, security is not something that you can forget, okay? Implement well and then forget. Uh, you need to, you know, always, uh, uh, you know, check if there are problems, potential problems, and try to be proactive in fixing them, okay? There's plenty of places, I'm sure that in other courses they will show you where to go and where to check. I mean, there are, there are these uh, bug trackers and these places where these uh, vulnerabilities get published, okay? And you can check and you can, you, you can subscribe to these uh, places, uh, these systems and so on, get notifications, of course, about what, what concerns you. If you're dealing with a web application, probably, you're not caring that much about, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, fingerprinting authentication vulnerabilities, okay? If you are not using them, okay? Um, so, you need to, how to say, uh, not to lose too much time in these activities, but there are resources around that can help you in this, uh, in this regard, okay? Um, so that's more or less what I wanted to say. If, if you have questions, I'm, I'm glad to answer. Otherwise, I think we can break for 10 minutes. In the meanwhile, I'll prepare the demo, okay? The deployment demo. And then we will discuss about this. The demo should last, I don't know, hopefully like uh, half an hour maximum. Everything is already prepared unless there's something wrong. <laughs> if that goes wrong, I mean, it should work. Okay, and then we will have time to discuss for the, uh, for the exam. I already published the rules and stuff. I hope you read them. Uh, uh, let, let me just uh, show them to you. Uh, yeah, you see here, but also there's a link uh, for discussion of exam rules. Okay, so there are uh, rules. I hope you read them, but these are online since the beginning of the course. The new stuff is here, okay? Instructions, uh, GitHub Classroom, most frequent errors, I invite to read them, and we will discuss briefly. This is a long document, but I hope it's uh, really helpful. Okay, let's stop here, otherwise we won't break. <laughs>